fought me and uh, arm twisted me into coming here, so I could not say no because I have a great deal of respect and admiration for him. And I've known him for a long time. And uh, I should say that uh, I, I, I do espouse some of his um, uh, his views uh, for a long time. And uh, one of the points that he mentioned uh, earlier was about women. And I remember in the 19, uh, mid to late 80s when I was the board of directors of the U.S. Fox and Economic Council in New York, uh, Mr. Berkey came and he mentioned something about it, and I'll quote him so I won't please plagiarize it. He mentioned that how can we as a nation progress when 50% of our population is in a non-productive capacity? Am I quoting you correctly? And I believe in that too. Um, also, I also believe in that uh, the challenges we face and the negatives that we face are there, as are in many countries uh, of the developing world. But then again, as I agree with him also, that uh, the positives should not be overlooked. Because in my view, the positives outweigh the negatives. And uh, I cite the earlier speakers who talked about how they had a personal agenda in coming back to Fox and why they came back, because they saw opportunity. Well, I have a similar reason. Uh, as uh, uh, Moza mentioned, and as, as of, uh, I've already mentioned, I came from the private sector. Um, worked at J.P. Morgan Chase in New York. Uh, 15 years after that with Bank of America and Merrill Lynch in New York and London. And I came to join the Central Bank in 2007 as a deputy governor. And uh, the reason I came is because I saw an opportunity. Uh, it took me five months to accept the position when it was uh, offered to me and I was approached. I did not have a CV made up. But I thought long and hard. And I took that decision because I, I saw a light at the end of the tunnel. And I can say I did not see that light as an oncoming locomotive. So, so far, I have had no regrets. But one of the things that uh, Mr. Berkey mentioned earlier, and I want to just capsulize a couple of items. I mentioned that I have not listened to him uh, uh, on, on a couple of areas, uh, the agriculture and SME sectors, which he pointed out very correctly. Uh, but I've been on the driver's seat here only for about 10 months, so uh, I, I have started in that 10 months, Mr. Berkey, in that these two or three areas I do believe in very, uh, very much so. Uh, the three engines of growth of any economy are the agricultural SME and the real estate. Uh, if you, some of you know the United States, uh, California as a state itself in the 60s, 70s, 80s was the fifth largest economy in the world. It's because of these three sectors, uh, agriculture, SME, and, uh, and uh, real estate. Uh, real estate I won't touch on because we have a long way to go before we um, establish the fixed income market, which was mentioned earlier, the capital markets that have to be set up. Because Pakistan has huge potential, but our outstanding in the banking sector for real estate is only about 1% of GDP. The United States is 65% and 110% in the UK. Of course, that is an area that we need to develop, and we are working with the SSCP uh, very, very actively to see if we can develop over the next couple of years the yield curve up to 25 years so we can provide a fixed income market. But on the agricultural side, it is the engine of growth. 22% of our GDP, 45% of our workforce. And yes, it's already been touched upon how we are the fourth or fifth largest milk producer in the world. And our cows produce a little over 1,000 liters of per year. Um, Australian cows produce about five, six, seven thousand, 7,000. And U.S. cows produce about 10,000 liters per annum. Well, that's, that's because genetically they've been producing, uh, manufacturing those cows for, for a century or more. But Engro, as was mentioned earlier, Nestle, and other entities have started importing these cows and are beginning to produce these uh, capitalize on this opportunity. And uh, look at New Zealand and uh, Denmark, they're small producers, but they export a lot of their dairy products. I feel that Pakistan has the potential of producing about 500 million to a billion dollars in export revenue from exporting these dairy products eventually. That's the opportunity that exists. I know one company in, in, um, in Sin is producing homogenized, pasteurized milk, state-of-the-art equipment, computerized, very small manpower, but it's providing milk to the uh, Karachi or the Sindh province. Shelf life is three, three days. That tells you the freshness and the kind of facilities that they have. And there are partners that they are looking at from overseas, particularly from Saudi Arabia, in developing uh, partnerships in exploiting this area a bit more. Uh, one of the areas that wasn't touched on, and I, it's my pet peeve, of course, is the banking sector. You know, the world world has gone through a global crisis. And I won't talk about the subprime business because that's, a, that's an area that you already know about. But look at the carnage that's taken place in the, uh, in the globe. Well, fortunately, the Pakistan banking sector was very resilient. We did not have a single collapse of a particular institution. 
right? If we had no derivatives products, because first of all, I don't understand these opaque products myself, <laughs> Merrill Lynch, and I'm not sure if the regulators in the United States or Europe understood them either. And there's still, the carnage is still continuing. Look at this LIBOR crisis. Does anyone know how much is outstanding based on LIBOR in terms of loans and securities? If not, let me tell you, it's an $800 trillion, trillion dollars of exposure in these LIBOR-based instruments. It's not over yet. We've got 69 trillion or so of, of, of uh, market cap of the global economy. It's huge, and lawsuits that are gonna come out, they've yet to flow out through. Well, fortunately, the banking sector in Pakistan is not subject to this. <coughs> Our returns have been very, very attractive in the sector. The spreads have been attractive. We've got the risk-reward ratio, of course, that you look at. Our capital adequacy ratio is about 14%, whereas the international standard is about 8 to 10%. We're well cushioned uh, to meet with the Basel III Accords, which kick in around 2019. We're already up to speed in some of those requirements. So Basel II, we fully are compliant. So we're very conservative in that area, and we provide a great deal of opportunity for offshore investors to come in. Some people have talked about some investors multinational selling out to local companies. Well, conversely, we've got other institutions in the bank sector that are coming in. Just to give you an idea, the largest bank in the world, ICBC, Industrial Commercial Bank of China, has opened its doors in Pakistan. They've opened two branches, they're gonna open a couple more. This was last year. Huge entity, they have got huge opportunities to finance not only the Chinese companies, but other projects in Pakistan. Another large bank, Largest Turkish bank, Ishbankazi, has already decided to come here. They're bidding on HSBC branches, but they, if they don't get that, they'll still open branches uh, in our backyard. Third, there's another Turkish bank that is considering coming to Pakistan because there are opportunities that they see. There's another large, I, come, I can't give the name out right now, but they've come and seen me. They're waiting for board approval. One of the top 10 banks in the world is also considering opening its doors in Pakistan. These are some of the positives that I, I'd like to hi highlight in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the opportunities that do exist and those people who, as Mr. Munir mentioned, know how to navigate. And, and uh, I'll, he explained it very well, but you know, one of the key components of navigation is patience. Uh, patience is important. It's the old risk-reward ratio. Ultimately, people who are understand, understand the market, who understand the multinational environment, understand the relationship building, understand the bureaucracy, which exists in every country in the world. You can navigate successfully and get attractive returns like Engros and Abbott's and others have, uh, have, have uh, experienced. Now, one very important point, Pakistan has gone through a turbulent ro roller coaster ride. Look at the 90s, late 90s, when we had about $100 million in reserves. Even those difficult times, Pakistan has never ever defaulted on repatriation of multinational corporations' dividends that we paid out. It's a very powerful statement. ICIs and IBITs and others have never had difficulties repatriation of their the profits. So if you're an offshore investor, that is a comfort level that you can, they can, you can uh, under, uh, identify with. Um, they, they're, I, I, I mentioned about the uh, banks coming in. There are a couple of other investors that are coming in. I was in Saudi Arabia just last month. And uh, lo and behold, Saudis have uh, a couple of the private sector institutions or, or Companies there are huge uh, by Pakistan standards and by Singapore standards. Uh, they have market caps or, or net worths in excess of $15 billion, some of them. Uh, they're considering investing in the agricultural sector as well as in some of the banking sectors. So you've got some positive uh, feedback that's uh, coming in the poll. I heard, of course, there's a lot of corruption in Pakistan. Well, where isn't there corruption? I worked many years in New York, and I saw a lot of corruption in there. I worked a lot of years in London, 10 years in London before I moved here. 14 years in New York, I can tell you the corruption that I saw in Fermi, in, in, in Wall Street. But look what's happening. Mr. Madoff, who made off with $50 billion. And I cite more and more anti-money laundering schemes. Look at the banks that have been identified. Well, Pakistan has a standard of anti-money laundering schemes that are much higher than Western standards in the United States or England. And I can vouch for that because nobody has been able to challenge me, the U.S. Treasury, OFAC, or anybody in the uh, United States or England who've come to see me. They have not. Okay, very good. I'll just wrap up there. Those are the positives that I just wanted to highlight before, uh, since some of the uh, gentlemen had talked about it before. I'll leave the floor open to you. To get the conversation going, I'll see one question I have which is uh, 
Because uh, it does not provide me with the complete independence and the control mechanisms that enables me to um, to control the uh, borrowings uh, that Mr. Berkey was alluding to on the fiscal side. The, the, the three basic challenges that I see that Pakistan has: um, one is revenues, uh, balance of payments, and private sector credit. You fix the first one and the others fall into place. Um, the uh, uh, revenue side requires, obviously, what Mr. Berkey mentioned earlier about the low tax to GDP ratio of 8.5%. That is a major task that we have to address, without which we're not going to be able to uh, meet our fiscal deficit targets. Um, we have the uh, United States at about 28%, uh, European countries about 40% plus. Uh, we have not done very well there. And how I can bounce a check? Well, which um, central bank bounces the uh, government's check? I, I don't have the authority to do that, frankly speaking. Uh, and furthermore, uh, yes, and we do. We've done that. We've got ways and lean, the lean, uh, means limits uh, of provincial governments, and we do we have balanced those. But many times the fiscal authorities come up and give them a little bit of a flexible leeway in the last 24 hours. That happens too. Now the problem we've had there, and uh, some of the uh, uh, the borrowings, of course, is that the NFC awards that were um, allocated a couple of years back were allocated the uh, federal budget to the provinces. Unfortunately, the provinces have not met there. Uh, deficit targets or the surplus targets that they were expecting. So as a result, the borrowings have gone through the roof. How, how do you control that? Uh, frankly speaking, I, I don't have an answer to say yes emphatically that we can control it. What we have done is very, very actively in our monetary policy statements. Uh, every two months, we have a twice a year a press conference and every two months we have a monetary policy statement which has highlighted, if you look back, in the last 10 months to a year, you've highlighted very actively um, this particular area, that the areas that must be controlled in order for us to see sustainable economic development is this area, fiscal management or fiscal mismanagement. And the borrowings must be stopped, otherwise it is inflationary. Um, so uh, to, in a roundabout way, I'm not sure if I can uh, be honest about it, but this is an area that we have highlighted repeatedly in our quarterly reports, and our annual reports, and I think they've been quite hard-hitting. Uh, I've been beaten up quite badly, by the way, and by certain quarters about being critical about the uh, fiscal borrowings that have been very heavy. So uh, we're going to continue that, and we're going to keep a tight belt on the provincial borrowings as well. Can I be a little bit mischievous? Uh, when, we, when we had dinner last night, you said to me, uh, we were talking about 
uh, getting together in Islamabad, and you said, I go to Islamabad every week. Uh, when I was briefly finance minister of Pakistan, uh, your, one of your predecessors used to come to Islamabad three times a week. And I said to him, why do you come to Islamabad three times a week? You are an autonomous uh, part of the government. You need to stay in Karachi and do whatever you want to do. You don't have to come and consult the Ministry of Finance. The Ministry of Finance is not your boss. It's friends like you who need enemies. <laughs> Well, you know, the Wall Street Journal did quote me accurately there, and I stand by it. I am not as independent as I would like to be. For example, on the borrowing side, I would have liked to see 10% on the revenue side as a restriction, and as some countries have it. I'm not there three times a week, and I don't even go very often to the Ministry of Finance. Uh, hence, I don't think they particularly like me. Um, but no, I am a very, very staunch independent uh, thinker, independent uh, operator as far as the state bank is concerned. Uh, the autonomous status of the state bank is there to some degree, uh, albeit, as I mentioned earlier, not as watertight as I would like to see. For example, the borrowing side. The government does require zeroing out the quarterly borrowings. Granted, they failed last quarter. But there is, a, under the uh, State Bank Act, the new amendments, they're required to wind down the borrowings that have accumulated over the next seven years down to zero. And if they do exceed the quarterly borrowings or the annual borrowings at the end of the year, they must, again, this is a, a memo or an explanation the finance minister has to uh, provide to the parliament as to why they breached that borrowing. But then again, the memo is perhaps worth the paper it's on, but it is something that is a caveat that's been built in. So, independent, yes, to the extent where I don't travel as frequently to Islamabad, um, not independent enough to be able to bounce those checks. Yes, sir. Briefly, a question. Well, you talk about uh, some of the entrants who are looking at Pakistan for banks, and one hears the news that all the banks are going to First of all, HSBC, you mentioned, is pulling out not because of Pakistan specific. Um, it is a regional, it's a global uh, deleveraging that the process they're going through. They're pulling out of Chile, from New Zealand, uh, as well as Pakistan. So it's purely uh, part of their overall strategy, given what's happening in the Eurozone crisis. You know that the cost of capital has gone up, and they need to maintain capital to maintain those ratios that are upcoming. And there's more nonsense to come out of the Eurozone crisis, and I can go on to stories about what will happen there in the coming months and years, as well as the U.S., uh, but that's a topic for a separate uh, session. Um, so that is not Pakistan-specific. Citibank is not pulling on. In fact, they just uh, reduced their commitment to a particular sector, the credit card and consumer areas, where they weren't as, uh, they couldn't commit resources, perhaps, to build that business. Why? Because of obviously what's going on in the United States and Citibank itself. So it's not Pakistan-specific again. Uh, as far as extrication of, of that bank, well, you've got more coming in. So the numbers outweigh, the new entrants outweigh the new ones, uh, the, old, the old ones that are going out. So I think you'll find that these particular institutions have a whole team of clients from their own countries that are making entry. The Turkish construction companies are coming to see us as well. They're making uh, some... Uh, uh, they're, they're in fact bidding on certain contracts. Same thing with the Chinese companies, Huawei and other companies, major telecommunications companies. The three, and the main sector, of course, is the power sector and the uh, telecommunications sectors. And these are companies that are major in their own home turf, and their banks, they're following the banks, and vice versa, because they want to find their client base to their own network. That's a traditional pattern of any international bank, and you'll find more coming in. What's the proportion of if you consider Standard Chartered, which is actually a localized bank because they're incorporated there, but let's consider that as a foreign bank for all intents and purposes. Uh, I, I'd say they're about uh, 30%, 25 to 30%.
because you've got a deposit base of five largest banks, so the Pakistani banks, 65% control of the deposit base. Good. I think Pakistan is very lucky, unlike your neighbor, where the PR seems to be volatile and probably on the downward trend. So 